the world is changing and the world is on fire and things are constantly moving. But the question is, how do we always pivot? How do we always change what we're actually looking to do? And how can we take chaos and turn it into opportunity? How can we take something that we built from nothing and are growing and building and be able to weave through the, the changes of life? Right now, there's a lot of changes going on. So we thought for, for you today to bring Greg Brown, who is a change expert, has, is a keynote speaker across the country, have given over 500 keynote speakers, uh, is rated one of the top change leaders in the world So for, for Inc. So written a book called Spark Action. Uh, Greg, we're really excited to have you on. We're really excited for our listeners to hear what you're talking about and hear what you're preaching and, and, and educate people how to get through this tumultuous time. So first, can you give us a little background about you, how you got to where you are? And then we have some questions just while people are going through the, the walks of life. I, I don't know if it's going to be preaching, though. I don't know if it's preaching necessarily yeah. the right word. Yeah, I won't be preaching today. That's not my background. So my background, I really, you know, started working with people and teaching people and speaking when I was 10 years old. I sat my friends down in front of a chalkboard and tried to teach them math, which was not my strongest subject. And then I went to camp that many kids did, and I taught canoeing. And I really love that concept of teaching and working with people and helping them shift and change as we go through life. And then my work experience started um, as part of the team that opened the first wave of Starbucks in Canada many, many years ago. And then I you know, did what a lot of people do. I was in my late 20s, I guess, at that point. And I wanted to contribute to the world in a different way. So I started volunteering. And I started working in healthcare and volunteering, working with people who are homeless, living on the street. And that really started my career. And then I went into corporate. And, you know, when you work with people who are in trauma and in difficulty, and, and you know, this is a veteran year, you know, it prepares you to deal with organizational life with a lot of different tool sets and skills that many other people don't have. Yeah, I, I was I was listening to somebody the other day and he was talking about um, I think it was Lex Friedman. He was talking about how people who have gone through some real struggles are able to then understand and to spread and be more diversified to handle people to a higher level. She wasn't Lex Friedman. It was actually uh, a client, Paul Robinson, who was coming on the podcast this week. And he was talking about how because he was able to go through challenges, he went through bankruptcy. They, they, came, yeah. took, they came into his house and took his cars that he can advise people how to avoid pitfalls at very similar to the struggles that we went through and having that diversified background. Well, once you go through it, then you have that compassion that you have that connection, you know, what people are going through and you, you know, again, you know, people, you can lecture people, but unless they, they know that you're connected with them and that they, you, you know, you're on their side and you're feeling for them, it doesn't make a difference. They're not listening. Absolutely. So what are you doing now to empower people through your platform? Well, I do. I used to do consulting and, and mostly now I do a lot of speaking and workshops and work with different organizations, both private, public sector, you know, international ones from, you know, the UN through to smaller local banks, as an example. And, and one of the things I try to remind people of is that we are way more capable at handling lots of change than we think we are. We can do more than we think we can. And, and, you know, if you think back to the last four or five years and everything we went through with COVID and then all the stuff that's going on a global stage right now, that's a lot. And I really believe that we have knowledge, skills and ability that when we look at our past and go, how did I get through those those times? We can apply those to how we navigate the future. And I think that's where my focus has been for the last couple of years. Gotcha. So navigating through COVID, but what about now? So, so let's say we look at the global stage mm -hmm. and the fear is World War III. The fear yep. is Middle East crisis. The fear is in our world, very, very prevalent anti-Semitism. What is the future of the Jews in these communities? Mm -hmm. How are you guiding people through this? Because it's, it's really challenging. And what should our listeners be thinking? Well, I think there's a few we things. Just, uh, we should all go to Israel. Maybe that should be your recommendation. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, there's a few things around that. I think it's supposed, I think it's important for us to be conscious of what's going on on a global scale. I don't think it's important. I don't think it's good to put your head into the sand and just be, oh, life is really good in my little circle. I don't care about what's going on here. And a lot of people use that strategy as a way to handle what's going on. I think it's supposed to be globally aware. And I think it's important for us at a local level and on a day-to-day -day level to think about 
what our interactions are, how we deal with people, what does that look like? What does peace look like that for us? Because it starts with each of us. You know, I say this when people ask me, you know, on big stages about organizational culture, like how do we change the culture? What well, starts with each individual, you know? And I really recommend, I believe, you know, in if, if you think about the world, I don't believe most people on the planet want to be polarized. Meaning I don't believe that we w don't want to like our neighbors. I don't believe that, you know, we want to hate the people we work with and we want to hate our colleagues and our countrymen. I believe most of us want to play in the middle and like the people we work with, like the people we talk to, like our neighbors and all that stuff. Yes, the polarization makes the news, but I think it is important to be aware and to do what you can within your scope of whatever you can to help on whatever issues are that are going on, such as what's going on in Israel right now. And I think it's important to not just go, okay, this is going on here, but to look at how do I act on a day-to-day -day basis? Am I building peace with people? Am I kind? What are my judgments? How do I manage those? Do I create conflict in my day-to-day? -day? Because when we create conflict in our day-to-day, -day, that escalates. So let's talk, let's talk for uh, a second how, I mean, sorry. You look at these huge companies, mm -hmm. like we're, we're right now, we have a back end office called Osaic Wealth, and, and they're a massive, massive, massive company. And they've had a lot of firings. They've had a lot of change in the workplace. And it, I'm sure the morale in the back office, we don't mm -hmm. really deal with it, but in the back office is really, is really down. So you're saying, okay, fine. Each individual should figure out how they should do it on, a, on, on their own basis. Mm -hmm. But how does that actually help impact culture? during change well, well, you, before you start greg i mean just you know in judaism also we believe that you know oh i want to fix my neighbor i want to fix the community i got to start fixing myself that's where i got to start from and i think that's what greg is saying yeah and uh, you're right and i you know i tell every leader that to be a good leader you need to get a phd in yourself you need to know what ticks you off what pushes your buttons what does it look like because that influences how you engage with your team members and influences how you engage with your stakeholders, how you engage with your clients. If you don't know how to manage this and you don't have a PhD in your stuff, it's well, we've all had bosses that are nightmares, you know, and we don't want that. So let me go back to your question here. What was, can you repeat yours? Yes. When there's internal ways of changing and yeah. how you handle external. But when there is true chaos, let's say in your company, yeah. and everyone's getting fired and morale is down, and you don't know if you're gonna have a job tomorrow, how do you manage that? So I think one of the most important things to do, um, and I, I wrote a paper on this years ago called The Tyranny of Positive Thinking. What often I see leaders and business owners, entrepreneurs, it doesn't matter who you are, they'll put a positive spin on a bad situation. So whether it's terminations, firings, downsizings, cost cutting, whatever's through, they're like, oh, we're doing this for our clients or we're doing it to stay solvent or we're, you know, whatever it is. And that's great, good, good for you. The rest of us are here worried about our jobs, just like what you say. And I think the biggest thing that a leader can do or the owner, whoever it is in that organization, is to not put a positive spin on this and to have the dialogue with people like this is crap it's hard it could be worse and i'm hearing it with you and this is the thing that you know uh, i really could preach from the rooftops if you want to use that term is that you know sometimes as leaders were behind guiding like a bulldozer you know guiding the team sometimes we're at the front because we have a clear vision and everybody's on board and things are tra la la and we're getting to the end most of the time with difficult disruptive change we're in it with our teams and we're leading alongside our teams and the challenge is we think as leaders that we need to have all the answers and we don't if we can create what I call a community of understanding where you get, you know, get everyone together, just get all the crap on the table. Because listening and acknowledging people's issues about how hard it is, how difficult, all that stuff can move people down the path as much as problem solving. So if you think about it, if you've had, ever had a bad day at work or any of the people listening, 
Um, I know not where you work now, but other places. Our company is amazing. Yeah, where you've had a bad day and you know, you go home and you're like, oh my gosh, I had the most rotten day. David was on me about this and Greg wouldn't stop about that. And my client was going on about this. And the person listening to you goes, hey, don't worry about it. At least you have a job, you know, which is what my mom would say to me growing so up. Helpful. So helpful. But that's not, what does it do? It escalates you. It escalates. But if you say, hey, Gary, sounds like you had a really bad day. You're like, yeah, it de-escalates. So I think, you know, listening and acknowledging is really important. And our job as leaders is to always elevate, elevate, elevate the conversation, not escalate it. And we and people look to us with all the answers if we're the leader or owner. And we have to say we don't have them. We don't know what the future is going to look like. And often when I know I'm in the same boat as you, I can feel better. It doesn't mean it's going to be roses and lollipops and sunshine. But what it does mean is that I know we're going to be together in this, whether I get a job or don't get a job or crap, it's the fan, whatever. And it's the biggest thing I can tell people is don't paper negativity over with positivity. Well, I, I think it's a huge one, thing. One thing, I just say, just to compliment you, Yair, also one thing that Yair, and Yair is the one that started our business. I joined him. We call it a uh, son father business throws people off a little bit, but you know, he says, problems come up. He always says, you know what? We're going to figure it out. You know, and that's, you know, and there's, there's brain science around saying we're going to figure it out because what happens if you say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what's going to happen. Your brain starts to generate more ways to not figure it out. But when you use language, like I'm going to figure it out, which is not positive thinking, Positive thinking is, I've got the answer. I've got the answer. And you don't. That's, you know, those fake things where, yeah. you know, I've read things like, you know, stand in front of the mirror and go, I'm rich. I'm rich. Well, your internal dialogue is saying, no, you're not. You loser. You don't have two cents in the bank. So when there's a disconnect between what you're thinking and what you're saying, this is going to override it. Whereas what you're saying is so great, David, which say, we're going to figure this out your brain will start to develop ideas to figure it out in like two minutes because we all get stuck in, I don't know what to do. And it's exactly what you're saying. Look, at I don't, I don't have all the answers. How can I possibly know everything that's going to come up? How can nobody could have all the answers, yeah. but I know I have your back and we're going to figure, we can figure it out together. And, exactly. and, and, you will and, figure panic. It. and don't panic. You'll always figure it out. We always figure you it out. Have. Well, the main thing is understanding that there's always a way out. There's always a way to make things better. And I think that's a great point that you're saying is, and, and for everyone listening, it's really, really deep, is to acknowledge what the actual situation is instead of hiding what the actual situation is. And yeah. that's really that's really what we're talking about here. So let's just go through the stages. I acknowledge that the world is on fire. Everything is challenging. And now I'm not alone because I now have related to other people and now we're close. Absolutely. What is the next stage for people? What is the next stage after now that they don't feel alone? Because that's what you're saying. You're saying eliminate loneliness and, and come collective and work as a team to get through it. What is the next stage? What is, what is the actual action step? So, so I think the next stage is sometimes you got to get into the negativity to get out of it, right? And I, I like to contain that. And I say, you know what? With my, I used to do this with my team. I worked for an organization where we were moving our offices to and a half. They were, they were north of the city where I live, which is Toronto, Canada. We were moving a two hour, two and a half hour commute to downtown Toronto. So that would be like where you are in New York, you know, going in from Connecticut to New York, all of a sudden your office in Connecticut, you're moving to New York, you're going to, this commute's going to increase. And I was, wasn't my decision. And I sat down and it was going to create, you know, work for me and my team. And I was going to lose a bunch of team members. And I sat down with everyone at the beginning and I said, look, some of you are going to hate this, some of you are going to like it. Not my decision. Let's just get all the crap on the table. Because our job is to contain the crap, I say as leaders. Otherwise, it comes out at the water cooler with coffee and lunch, texting each other all the time. No, let's, let's contain it. And I did that for 10 minutes. Every staff meeting for a year, we started with a complaint session just to contain it. Then the next part is you have to wrap it up and say, hey, yes, this is what's going on. And we need to figure a way to keep going. 
And you notice I did not say the word but, and that's a real key thing when we're having dialogues about conflict, is about saying stuff like, yeah, it's really bad, and this is the complaints, and what do we need to do to keep going? And that's the next step. What do we need to do to get through this? What is, or, and sometimes it can be more of a laser type of question where you focus and say, you know, what's one thing we can do today that's going to get us out of this and start moving down the path? Because we don't know what the future holds. And, and that was like during COVID, you know, we had to all bring our focus into almost, you know, into a daily aspect because we couldn't think three months out at the beginning. And it's about you know, doing that laser focus around what is the next step and not getting overwhelmed with everything that's going on. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. It's talking about actually taking action steps, but it's limiting complaining. Because once you go down the complaining, I want to find a good word with it, like the complaining carrier or something like that, that rhymes with C, I'll, I'll think of something later. Um, you can really get stuck in it and it can really yeah. hold people back. And then you just become... Then you just become that complainer and people don't like no, that person. No, no. So and, and, and the trick with complaints is, you know, people will keep repeating themselves. And again, it's brain science. People will repeat themselves unless they feel heard. So if you say, hey, I hear, you know, we can't make people less busy. So, yeah, if you complain to me about being busy and I still need you to get to do something, I'll say, hey, yeah, I hear you're busy and I still need you to get that done. But I think also like when you have that first session, you get the complaining out of the t out of the table, yep. the public forum. It's a lot different when you hear it loud and it's straightforward as opposed to the rumbling by the oh, oh what is it? It's such an ass, and you know. And yeah, that, yeah, yeah. But that just generates more inside you. But when you get it out on the table, you know what? You're listening. I hear it. I hear there's a complaining, but what you know, life. That's what life is about. Absolutely. And again, it's important to listen. And then we got to move on and we want to contain it. Our job as leaders is to contain it and not ignore it. Otherwise, it does percolate up. And guess what? People's productivity drops. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's showing it's that same thing, keeping everybody close and managing, managing the ways that teams can break apart. Yeah. You've had a lot of tips for people who have going off on their own and yeah. entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs going through a lot of struggles mm -hmm. and things like that. What are the tips that you're giving somebody who's thinking about leaving their current status and current company and going yeah. off on their own? Because number one, they want one more freedom. Number two, they want more money. And number three, they want to, they want to live their own dream. The self-actualization concept is Absolutely. very, very prevalent in the entrepreneurship role. So how are you guiding people from what we call bank mentality to entrepreneurship? So, so a few things. First off, I don't believe everyone is an entrepreneur or can be. Some people are great at it. Some people are good. Some people cannot deal with the risk associated with it. So that's sort of the first thing. So sometimes when I'm mentoring entrepreneurs, you know, I say to them, look, be really open. Stuff might come up that you're not expecting. You might decide to go down this road. Um, once I sort of filtered that out and we were, they're like, wanting they really want to be an entrepreneur because they think it's all about cash and this and like it's a lot of work first thing i say to them is don't quit your job until you're making enough money in your business to pay your rent because there's nothing worse like there's like if you quit your job um and you can't pay your rent you're gonna be too stressed you won't be able to run a business now, if you're let go from your work there might be a nice pressure point for you to actually keep your business and be really focused on it so that's the other thing. And there's a challenge there because if you're working at a job, it is hard to do a business off the side, but you still need to pay your bills. What I Once sort of that's dealt with, the first thing I say is don't wait till it's perfect. Just start and get some sales. Everybody wants to, they spend, my first business 30 something years ago, other than a paper route and garage sales, which I loved to do as an entrepreneur since I was like five. Um, my first job, uh, my first business, I started with a girlfriend of mine, and this was before the internet. So, yeah, I don't know if you're old enough to know what that is like, but David and I do. Yeah, I only know ChatGPT and on. Okay, well, there you go. So, David and I know what that's like. We developed a brochure, and in a year, we developed a brochure. Yeah. It was, I know, yeah. it was, it was really nice. It was color, you know, all that stuff. And we spent a whole year developing and doing the words. We got them printed. We did this. We did that. At the end of the year, we're sitting in my living room where many businesses start. 
And I'm like, we don't have any clients. We don't have any business. And that was a big lesson for me in that I really learned that I tell people this all the time. Don't worry about your logo. Don't worry about the name. Call it your first name in solutions or this. It doesn't matter what it's called. Get your product or service out and see if people are going to buy it. And if you tell me, oh, you know, I'm, I made a new mobile phone, I'm going to be like, so is ever like, how are you going to compete with Android and Apple? You're like, you know, oh, I'm making, you know, a polo shirt. I'm like, okay. You know, so it's really about get the sales and not from your friends and family. And so I, I actually had a, a friend, a good friend of mine. Yeah. His name is David Margulies. He actually started CD Radio, or now it's CD Radio, but now it's called uh, Serious Satellite Radio. Serious Satellite. Oh, I love that. And he grew up in he grew up in Vancouver, well, so he started off in in high school. I'll make this short because yet your doesn't let me tell long stories. It's very long. It's very. But long I'll make it quick. But he started as an entrepreneur in high school. Yeah. And he went down and he became a travel agent for like spring break. And he's and he he tells me the story about how he's down in in Hawaii or whatever, and everything's falling apart. And his father was also an entrepreneur. He calls up his father, Dad. Rah, 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 rah. His dad says, what "Are you talking about? Get back to work and shut up, and just go and go and do it." What are you talking about? Then he had a paging company. He went to university for like a month, and but and, and then he went. He had a paging company. Didn't know if it was going to work or not. He went down to the mall. He had a very fancy office. Went down to the mall and started selling it himself to okay. see if there was a market there, to see if this thing was going to go. Gotcha. And that's and what it built, is. You know, I wrote, Ally Radio, which is yeah, I wrote something called The Entrepreneur Manifesto a while ago for, I was doing a big entrepreneur program. And, you know, it, so many people have spent all this time and energy and money on logos and names. They don't know any business. I'm like, get the money in the door. Unless you have capital of $300,000, sitting around that you can just sit on, which most entrepreneurs don't see if people are going to buy your stuff. hundred percent. I, I tell people all the time that you need to be able first, the, the easiest thing you can trade when you're first starting a business is your time. Totally. So if you, if you need to go into a business and you don't have any money, great. Don't sell widgets. If you don't have any money, don't sell widgets because you need a lot of money for widgets. You the see. first thing you could sell is you. So it's sell perfect. your time, sell, for can, sure. can sell you can work, selling your time is working at a restaurant, is selling your time. Absolutely. Selling your time is trading that. But once you get into the widget business, then you need a lot of capital. And then your entrepreneurship journey dies very, very quickly. If you look at Shark Tank, why is it that all of these businesses are trying to raise capital? Because they are selling widgets. Widgets, not services. Not services. So at the beginning, you have to sell services after a certain amount of time where you can Build And once you're an entrepreneur, you can learn how to scale. It's, it's really, I'm sure you teach that a lot. But once you can figure out how to do two things in your day, so instead of doing 40 hours or 50 hours in one job, you do 30 hours in one job, 10 hours in the others, and you can start diversifying your entrepreneurship portfolio. Absolutely. Once you, know, you do that, then you can go into the widget business. You're so right. And that's the exact analogy I use with Shark Tank as well and widgets. Because I think what happens is, you know, people think that by putting their picture on Instagram, that they're going to get a million followers and they're going to be really rich because they're an influencer. I'm like, good luck on that, honey. You know, and, and, you know, when they see movie stars launch fragrances and stuff, they don't see that there's millions of dollars in branding and marketing and investment and partnerships and you know behind this it's not me going to the local corner store saying hi i'm gonna you know make perfume like and it's it's this fast road to success they think is going to happen i, I like it, the restaurants when the celebrities do the restaurants oh i can do a restaurant too oh it's so, I used to be the restaurant i was a waiter for many years so yeah i remember that and my last point that i tell entrepreneurs is whether it's staff, colleagues, partners, clients, only work with people you want to work with. Like pay attention to what's going on in your gut. I have something above my, I've had it for years above my desk and on, I even have it on the window here. It says, I only work with people I would like to have dinner with. And that has been a guiding principle for me. 
if I, and I, and most people I've never had dinner with just to be real clear, but if I can see myself sitting down to have a one hour conversation with someone and I, I like them, there's to be a likability factor for me. And this is sort of my guiding principle. And, but if I, if there's something off and you know, all your listeners and you are all smart, there's something in your gut or in your head that goes ding, 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 something's off about this person or this relationship or whatever it is. It's about paying attention to that, whether you need the money or not, because I'll guarantee if you don't pay attention and it's happened to me two or three times where I've ignored it and gone, Oh, I'll do this. It comes back and bites you badly. So, you know, pay attention to who you're partnering with, who your colleagues are, who your clients are, and put it out there, the type of people you want to work with, because they'll yeah. find you then. Well, that's that we actually did a big rebrand about a year ago, calling it call, talking about people who are resilient, who have overcome these obstacles and built success. Once we define that brand, we're now when we look at the pool of people, because we, we have a lot, thankfully, we have a lot of clients, we have really start saying, like we, we had somebody reach out to my dad, this woman, Laura, the other day. Yeah. We used to, if she would reach out, we would go to her house and talk to her. She oh. reaches out again this time and we say, no, no, we're sorry. We don't, we can't take any more clients right now. Like good we could, you. but it, we didn't say that to her, but no, I, we're good. You mean. I did say that to her. What are you talking about? That's what you yeah, told no, me. I'm saying you did tell her, you told her I we told can't her take that any more we're closed now. We're not no, but I'm clients. saying for our listeners and for Greg's listeners, we are looking, we are taking more clients, but we only are taking clients who are looking to push themselves past their certain situation to the next level. And they're continuously going to be resilient. For sure. If you're not that person, you don't even understand the person I'm talking about. Totally. And, I, you know, I speak on resilience all the time, so I really resonated with your title of that. Because people will think, you know, resilience is all about bouncing back from cancer or death or whatever. And, yes, it is that. Those are good things, and, too. Those are good it, things, too. Yeah, all, yeah, absolutely. And it's also about how we handle the little situations that come up during the day that can throw us. Like, how do we bounce back from those? How do we bounce back from those daily downturns, weekly downturns that can happen so we don't get sucked into that vortex of no movement? So I love that you, you have it called like that because it was very clear to me. So you speaking of resilience, mm -hmm. you've had moments in your life, a defining moment or defining moments in your life and something yeah. personal, I hope, you open up more than you do in your keynote speeches for this so we can get some exclusive content from Greg. Yeah, for sure. Open it up. Bring so on the my, water I, never, I don't think I've ever told this story before other than there to we are. friends. That That's gets your visine ready for That's the That's what we want. Yeah, and this is very much related, and this is why I love that you're in finance and it's about resilience and money because money has been a driving force in my life, and I'll tell you why. I... I was when I was growing up, my parents sold their house in the early 70s, which sort of dates me. And they never reinvested their money in real estate. And by nine, by you know, about 10 years after that, I remember being in a rental house we had, and this was my pivot sort of moment that I'm getting to. And we were downsizing to a two-bedroom apartment and subsidized housing from, from our four-bedroom rental house that we had. And I remember my mother, my mother had my grandmother's wedding furniture and she was giving it away. She was giving it away. Sorry about that. My grandmother's wedding furniture and she was giving it away. And because it wouldn't fit in her house. And I watched my mother cry as this furniture that had so much meaning for her was taken away. And that has stuck with me ever since. And I swore at that moment, I was think I was 14, that I would never let myself get into a financial situation where I did not have control over my finances, over how I lived, over where I lived, uh, and all that stuff. Because because they had no life insurance, they had no insurance, they had nothing. And and through throughout my dad had Alzheimer's, it was a bunch of reasons. But it was that moment that I was like, I can't ever let this happen to me. And I started, you know, I, I worked, you know, I worked through high school and I've, you know, I decided how I was going to make money, which was real estate first and, you know, did school and, and, you know, volunteered and worked and put cash away in that. And 
that was that moment. I said, I'm never going to be that way. And, and knock on wood, I've had good investments. I've got good financial planners. I've got accountants, good book. I've got, I don't know anything about money, just to be real clear. I know, I know all, all I want is more money to come in than goes out. That's all I want. That's all you got to know. That's all you got to know. And I have and main principle. And I have smart people that I can phone and say, can I do this? Can I do that? Can I who manage that for me? And just buy low and sell high. Yeah. I don't even know what that means. No, I know. <laughs> I do with real estate. I can do real estate with my eyes closed. Um, I can't do stocks, bonds, those investments, but I have people that do that. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have, and, and you know, you do this work. So you understand I wouldn't have the security and, and I do phone them probably every six months going, am I going to be broke? Am I, you know, cause I still have that defining moment, but it's pushed me to be successful for what I consider successful, which money for me is about getting freedom, being free where I can live, who I can associate with, how I can be. And that's, that's, it was that push of seeing my mom cry well, that day. It, it's very, we ha I have a similar story, but, mm -hmm. but for me, even now that, thank God, me and my father do incredibly well, like finance is really nice. Even I think like, oh my God, am I going to be broke? And then I, look, I have to look at my accounts and go, no, no, no you're, you're going to be okay. But like, even like we had, like me and my dad, just, just for example, We've had a great month. We've had some great clients. We had a slow, a very slow year, but we've had a great month. We had nice, some nice big sales, Dad. Okay. I had a bit of a slower year than last year too. That seems to be yeah. a trend across. Yeah, it's, 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 generally, it's it's uh, generally it's like that. But you know what it is like with, without your long story. Well, it wasn't going to be a long story. You it long felt story. like it was going to be you, long. It you felt know why? I can't tell my story because he, his story about David Margulies and nobody even knew. Okay, I want to hear yours. Over I my hear story. Story. I want to hear Yara's story. Go back to you. All right. Dad, put, yeah. you, put this in the complaint. This is at the beginning of the session. <laughs> you didn't give me a chance. You didn't give me a chance to complain. <laughs> it's not my – I'm not facilitating. <laughs> so, so even that thought of like, oh, well, we had, we had a great month. And like right after we closed, we're like, we're good. We're flush with cash. The business is doing great. And then right after, we're like, oh, no, we don't – you and my dad were talking today. We're like – yeah, we don't really have such a great pipeline. We're like, what about the five sales we just closed like an hour ago? You I know, do that I mean, all you know, the time. I do that all the time. Oh my gosh, I'm broke. And I'm like, you know what oh, it is? You know you're not. And I've I've been through it also. I've been through it. I haven't had that. I didn't have that defining moment like you had. Maybe it would have helped me if I had. Uh, my father was an accountant and we always. Mine yeah. was too. Oh my gosh. <laughs> But I think it's that fear, like it could, you feel like it could disappear yeah. tomorrow. Like I can yes. wake up and, and, and without explanation, the my, everything I have is completely gone and I'm in a big hole. So yeah. I have that fear that tomorrow it's, it's, I'm done. So, you know, uh oh. Well, yeah, I think I it's, Yair mentioned this a, a bit in that, and I'll just say it a different way is that, you know, there's the rational side of us, which is very clear about how much money we have in the bank and all that, and you know, the house and this and you know, all that stuff that we have. And then there's the emotional side, which is, you know, that situation that happened as a kid or as an adult or something you saw that activates you going, ugh. And it's those memories that drive you. And, you know, my whole, and I can tell you, this is, we each have our own, you know, life issues to work on. Mine is being at peace that I have enough money. I have enough, you know, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's being, a, and that's my whole life lesson. I'm still learning that. That's why we need people like you on the planet to help us. Yeah. No, it's, it's a big part of it. It's like saying to people like, you're good. You're, you're going to be okay. And it's the same concept as what you were saying at the beginning. It's, it's, it's get your complaints out first, show people that you are not alone and, yeah. and be connected and work through things together which I really love. One other piece of advice that, that we've learned and really we're mastering every day, we're yeah. trying to get better and better, is instead of just telling people, giving advice, when you have this well-roundedness, when you do take on those challenges, you are then able to give people experiences. And experiences that. pass to other people so much better than just telling them advice. Like the, the can I give a suggestion? 
piece of it. When someone says that to me, it's um, it's that, yeah. murderous. Who says that to you? Yeah, My yeah. mom says it all day long. Yeah, it's see, it's back to our parents. It's back to our parents, David. No. It's not my parents. My wife, it drives me crazy. She does a lot she of, said, can I have a suggestion? Can I make up a suggestion? No, you, no, can't, you can't, except for that make... 1% time that it actually makes sense. Or she brings out like a nice sandwich and you're like, ah, oh, you got me. Trick um, me, yeah. But so, so and, and that really goes into my question of, of how do you view money, but you view it as a driver for you. And, and I'm sure you love when you have a lot of cash, you feel really secure. Then all of a sudden you're like, all right, let's put this cash to work. And like it stresses you out. You yeah. put it to work. Then you feel like you don't have any money anymore. And you're like, am I going to be bankrupt? And the next thing you know, you're working much harder. So yeah. I tell people all the time, if you have that same drive, do not keep money in the bank. Do not give yourself that security if you are looking to drive yourself to the next stage. Yeah, and, I, and, what, and what I, tight. yeah, I agree with that. What I've done is, and I'm at a different place than a lot of people in their lives. Is that you know I'm at the point now, and I'm working on this. It's still work, where you know I try not to worry about what's in the bank and what's invested, and because it's there, and I try it. You know, I try to make decisions about if there's something that I want, I'm not going to be like crazy and spend ridiculous amounts that are extreme for me, but I try not to question it as much. It's like when I was younger, this is a good practice for people. I always tell them about if when they're worried about money and want to practice thinking without it always in the back of their head, when they go to a restaurant, do you make a decision based upon what the price is of the food with what you order? Or are you able to cover up the prices and order what you want? And people have a difficult time with that, some of them, when I've worked with them on money stuff. because I And I'll say to them, you know, look at the menu beforehand to make sure it's in your price range. Um, but, but are you really going to stiff yourself five bucks because the steak is five dollars more than the burger? And you really want well, to stay like seventy five dollars more. That's the yeah, problem. exactly. <laughs> but but and it, there is about value with that, of course, you know. But but there is a piece about if you have enough money to go to a restaurant, then you have enough money to have a drink if you want. Then you have enough money to buy what's on the menu. And yes, there is value attached. Like I'm not going to spend one hundred fifty five dollars on a piece of steak. That's just not me. But I have friends that do. I spend ridiculous amounts of money on airline travel so I can sit in business class, which Friends who are wealthier than me don't, you know, so it's all about what you value. But it's a great way to start making decisions where you you don't, you have a context of the money, but you're not, that's not driving what you're doing within that context. You know, if you have a great house, if you have two homes, one's $10,000 more than the other one, are you really going to say no to the $10,000 more house? Because it's going to maybe cost you an extra three bucks a month in a mortgage payment. Yeah. I said, my father, my father bought a cottage north of Toronto years and years ago. He went with his best friend who was in real estate. Mm -hmm. And he was looking, what do you think, Benny, of this? What do you think? He says to his friend, Benny, what do you think of this? He says, if you like it, just get it. Absolutely. If, you know, it's not within your range. Right? Yeah, it's in his range. But if you like it, don't worry about the little details here if you like it. But on the other side of it, Greg, you also don't want to let that fear take you over. No, you know you don't want to live like that in fear. You 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 acknowledge it, but you don't want to let it control you. I agree. You know, I have a friend who uh, was talking to me about money the other day. They make a good amount of money. They have no money. <laughs> and what's so funny about this is they manage. I hope he's never listens to this. Um, they manage it right to him. We're sending it right to him. What's yeah, yeah. <laughs> he they manage their budget down to the cent, so they have no freedom. And it's ridiculous. And I said to them, I make as much money as you. I have this much here. I have no idea what that other stuff goes to. And that's fine because that's my free money. If I want to spend it on Starbucks or a polo shirt, who cares if all the other stuff is paid? You got to have a life. You got to have a life. Well, and, and it's about, I always tell people, moving away from the language of not being able to afford something. It's like, I can't afford that shirt. Like, well, you make $300,000 a year, so you could afford the shirt. You're choosing not to spend your money on that. And it's a different mindset about choice versus I can't afford that vacation. I'm like, well, you could, but you're actually choosing to pay your rent instead. <laughs> and and it is, it's a concept of choice that people, with whether it's money or work, we want to blame other people or blame money or blame work or blame our boss when it's really a choice. 
Yeah, but they use it. Like, I'll use it as an excuse. My wife wants to do, oh, we can't afford that. Sorry, you know, just because I don't well, want to go. I don't want to buy that thing. I just don't Well, want there it. you go. It's about prioritization. Yeah, that's what question. it gets to. I can afford it. I just don't want it. You're, you're, you're not you're not shorts. I just don't want them. Exactly. I buy him. I have to buy him shorts, but you keep it. I don't need them. them. I don't need he any needs, shorts. He needs them. He looks like a he looks like a schlub with his basketball. He walks around gonna, with basketball shorts and he never played perfectly basketball. Perfectly fine. Right? They're perfectly fine. <laughs> They're not. Oh, uh, Greg, thank you so much for coming on. Um, how can people find you? I, I I'm looking forward to getting a free copy of your book because I'm choosing to not pay for your book. I'm just choosing to get a free copy. I can't, oh. afford, I can't afford it. <laughs> Well, they're only like ten bucks on Amazon or something. Yeah, so that's why they're like best sellers. American dollars. <laughs> yeah, so it's only five American dollars then. <laughs> and uh, and since it's such a good month, <laughs> most of that money doesn't go to me anyway. It goes to the publisher. That's true. Um, so where people can get hold of me is uh, bechangeready.com. So just type in b bechangeready.com. They can find all about me. There's lots of resources there with entrepreneur stuff, leadership, cha- how to handle change. There's nothing about family dynamics there, you two. So just be aware of that. <laughs> Why do we need that? that? You think we no, need that? Not it, but I did work for a firm where, you know, it was sort of a mom and pop firm, a quite a large one. And, you know, the, the two owners were husband and wife. And, oh, my gosh. I don't know how they that ever works together. Husband and wife. I don't know how they did. And they did. They actually were quite successful at it. But I ended up doing marriage counseling almost once. Oh, yeah. I had to back out really quickly. No, no. It's terrible. No, they could be successful. But how they spend so much time together is. Yeah. No, absolutely. I don't get it. So, yeah, go to BeChangeReady.com. Happy to connect with people there. And there's lots of resources, videos. The pod, This podcast will be linked from my website as well. And will be shared through all socials. Right. And we'll collaborate, of course, and, and push everybody and promote this. I mean, this is a really great episode. I think we really went through a lot. And I hope there's, there's a lot of different, deeper messages in inside the episode on how to start change and how to be comfortable with change. It's not necessarily to get you to be super successful, but it's about the, it's actually about that pivoting moment in your life that you make the choice. And even, and I really do like that restaurant analogy. I'm actually going to, I'll do a nice little clip on that, just talking about like, Make that as a challenge for yourself to see how you are as a person. Do your money, do your, do your money identification, get a PhD on yourself. How do you look at things? Um, but and that's really good for everything, it. whether you're an entrepreneur yep. or you work for someone else, whatever it is, that's good advice no matter what. Yep. Greg, so thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, thank you all of our listeners for coming in. We hope you took some value today. Uh, and as we always love, um, keep listening, keep, keep engaging. Thanks for all your messages and your emails. Uh, we really, we really do appreciate the listeners, uh, and and this has been an amazing journey so far. And meeting people like Greg is just another part of this amazing, incredible journey. So, Greg, thanks for coming on, and uh, we'll see everyone on the next. Thank one. you, thank you, everyone.